and boom, we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to the latest episode of the Electric Podcast. I'm Fred Lambert, your host. And this week, we have a sponsor. Wonder Capital is sponsoring a podcast again. Wonder, the best, the easiest way to invest in large-scale solar energy projects across the U.S. With Wonder, you can help finance renewable energy projects who are earning up to 7.5% return annually. To learn more, visit wondercapital.com slash electric. So I'm joined, as usual, by Seth Wintraub, but Seth is down in Florida this week. How are you doing, Seth? Good. It's nice and warm down here. Yeah, I bet. And uh, how did uh, your trip down go with uh, the Mole Axe? It was actually very uneventful. Um, we decided to just drive through the night. Um, we stopped at every supercharger we needed to. Um, there's quite a bit more. We, we went on a long trip a few years ago to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota in the Model S at the time. And we had to stop at basically every supercharger because there weren't that many at the, that point, And they were, uh, you know, kind of far apart. This time, uh, we were like, yeah, let's see how we're doing. Whenever it, it's starting to feel more like a gas station situation because down the East Coast corridor, there's, there's like supercharges every few exits. So at least, you know, in, in certain parts, <clears throat> like uh, New Jersey between New York and uh, Philadelphia, there's like one every two or three exits. Um, so it was more casual. Like, uh, we were like, let's see how we do. You know, if we want to drive fast, we can get behind a, a fast truck or something and just kind of draft off of that. We can go 85 or, you know, maybe we'll go 60, um, depending on the, you know, the traffic situation. And it wasn't such a, like, we have to stop at this one supercharger. Yeah, you no know, if we does. don't, if we don't make it there you know, we're screwed. It's, it was more like, let's just see how it goes. And then as the, the mileage, <clears throat> as the range goes down, um, then you start to make the plan of which supercharger to hit. And plus yeah. the, the navigation uh, system now has a better uh, um, way of calculating superchargers. Um, I didn't get the big update yet and or the subsequent update. I'm still <laughs> waiting for any kind of update. But um well, you're talking about the autopilot update that came out a, f yeah. a few weeks ago, so but now the there's the not, the new one that is coming out uh, this weekend. It hasn't come out yet. We we had the we have a preview on the, on electric right now for the navigation uh, system. But uh, like you said, there was already improvement into like you're talking about uh, uh, way uh, superchargers as waypoint uh, when when you, you do a trip. Is that what right? You, so you, like yeah. you can just map all the way to Florida, and it mm -hmm. it tells you where you think you're gonna it. It thinks you need to stop, and if you drive better than it anticipates, then you can actually, it'll actually change superchargers yeah. mid run. Yeah, that's already working pretty well too. And you can, uh, you can cancel a, a specific charge point, and then the because they try to optimize your wait time at the the charger, the supercharger too. So they want you to get at the supercharger as uh, low as possible for your state of charge of the battery in order to have a higher charge rate, and then you can leave uh, quicker. But uh, yeah, and uh, suppose well, what's going to change with the new navigation system is that apparently Tesla is going to be able to calculate the arrival point uh, better. So by calculating the arrival point better, they should also have an impact on your uh, state of charge at arrival, which ultimately also changes the fact that you, you're going to be able to plan for your charging a little bit better. So that's coming out this weekend. But as usual, it's batches. So. You, you can be waiting weeks, <laughs> like in like in the case of set with for for the, the last update, and uh, yeah. But um, speaking of Tesla this week, uh, we're gonna start with the fact that Tesla had a rough week on the on the stock market. Well, the old stock, yeah, the, the 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 old stock market had a rough week, always a, a rough start to the week. But uh, Tesla was particularly affected for a few different reasons uh, that sort of piled up over the week, starting with the fact that. Um, well, I think that, that that had the biggest impact first. It was the um, um, the the investigation by the NTSB, the Federal uh, Transport Authorities, into the crash that happened uh, a week ago uh, in Mountain View, where a Model X ended up uh, uh, having a front collision with a, a, a median barrier on the highway, and the driver unfortunately died. Of his injuries uh, at the hospital after, and the vehicle 
caught on fire at some point in in the accident it's there's a few different reports and when the car caught on fire exactly apparently the like the fire is not a cause the cause of the death uh, it's not what led to the to that like it was it was uh, extracted from the model x before the, the the car was completely on fire or at least the fire uh, penetrated the uh, passenger cabin which is when uh, it starts to get dangerous for for any passenger in the car. Yeah, and and you made a good point. I think when we were talking about it earlier, that um, the the state of the car in all the pictures is after the fireman or whoever arrived on the scene and probably cut the car in half, basically yeah, yeah. to get the guy out. Um, <clears throat> I know. I think Tesla said that they hadn't seen a Model X wreck that bad, and you know I hadn't certainly and. Um, obviously uh condolences to that guy's family but um it it probably wasn't as bad i mean I, who knows like what it looked like but um what, what what everybody saw and what all the pictures show is the vehicle after the fire and after basically the fire people cut the thing in half which is yeah. you know a big well, there, there, there was a few interesting about that crash and in particular of course now, now there's an investigation on it but uh first of all is of course I'll, as always if, if tesla's a tesla vehicle is involved in a crash then it becomes a new story because we wouldn't be talking about it if uh, any other car if there was a, a mercedes a glc uh, that that was involved in that crash no one would talk about it so whether that's good for the victim or not I, i'm not I, i'm not sure but uh so let's get out all of the way to start with like we're talking about it now because it is a news story, uh, unfortunately, and a national news story even. But uh, since then, there were uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people that die around the world on the <laughs> on the roads, uh, and uh, there were thousands of uh, fires, uh, car fire in the U.S. alone. So it's it's not nothing special to Tesla here. But now it's an investigation, and that, that's why it's interesting. So the, the National Transportation Safety Board is investigating the crash. But it's not necessarily investing Tesla here. So there, there was the autopilot component, and uh, but uh, there's always there's an, already another ongoing investigation on the autopilot with the crash, uh, not a fatal one, but a, a crash in uh, in Southern California where um, the a Model S supposedly on the autopilot, according to the uh, driver, ran into the back of a fire truck. So that's already currently an investigation, and that's specifically on the role of autopilot in that crash. Here, uh, Tesla didn't know if uh, the car was on the autopilot. Uh, the N NTSB doesn't know yet. But there's other aspect of the crash that could be investigated too. So, uh, of course, there was the fire. There was the extraction of the battery pack after. So Tesla uh, ended up sending engineers on the spot to help with the extraction of the battery pack. Uh, and then there's the, the third aspect to it that is being investigated right now, which is the potential role of the fact that the... Uh, the crash barrier uh, on the median was already destroyed a few weeks back by another crash. Uh, someone, someone already that wasn't in a Tesla, that wasn't on the, on the autopilot and everything, and they ended up crashing on that barrier. That didn't make the news, though. But uh, the driver survived, and uh, he actually told a, a news outlet in, a, a, in, in uh, the Bay Area that uh, he attributed staying alive because of that barrier. So the, normally that barrier was, it does it, it absorb a lot of the energy of the impact. Uh, and they never ended yeah. up. He was in a Prius. Yeah, it was in a Prius too. So uh, it's a, a lot lighter car, and um, it, they never ended up rebuilding that barrier. So you, you were a lot closer to the concrete, uh, the concrete part of the median instead of the uh, shock absorbing barrier. Yeah, and, I, I hope that's a, a result of the investigation. Is that hey, when those barriers get destroyed, there should be a new barrier up within hours not like weeks that that's the ideal solution sure but even if that's not possible for some reason because of course it's a construction okay. project uh, always extremely difficult and everything but there has to be a better way to um to handle like where where that barrier was because the, the all they did was like put a, a, another form of uh uh like a, a sign with uh, you know the the yellow and black lines on it on the concrete itself but that does n almost nothing to, to, to prevent. Uh, well, it's visible, but other than that, does nothing to prevent any accidents. So that's unfortunate. 
Tesla uh, ended up issuing a response to um, the investigate well, the, on the accident itself and the media response and the investigation. And that's one of the things that they mentioned um, as a potential reason for, for, for the, uh, well, not the accident itself, but the result of uh, the accident, which was a, a very grave impact on the mall X and the death of the, uh, of the driver. So maybe it, the accident would have happened anyway with the, the, the crash barrier. But uh, maybe it would have been less intense and less severe on the on the car, and the driver would have then survived. So we don't know. It's speculation at this point. The and and it has NTSB investigated a Tesla crash before the other fatal crash uh, on autopilot, which happened in Florida two three years three years back, and uh, that took about a year and a half to get the result from that report. And what it ended up saying is that. The autopilot wasn't necessarily at fault, meaning that it performed as expected as a level two driving SS system. But uh, they uh, uh, also said that it might have contributed to uh, the crash because of uh, potentially the driver not paying attention because it was on autopilot, which is. Yeah, I mean, like level two means you're paying attention. So any accident is like it's on you like we're not yeah we're not giving responsibility to the car at all yet yeah that, that's one of the things that i still come up with a lot of a uh, user um, when um the last update came up and some were concerned like it's it, it's starting to get so good with the autopilot 2.0 that you, you start to trust it more and more and you you're more inclined to start paying less attention to the road uh, and of course, it's, it's, there, there's an awkward, an awkward like transitional period between level two and level three. Um, well, where, where you could level three, you should pay attention to actually. So it's more, uh, well, level three is the awkward transitional period between level two and level four, actually. So where you have to handle that, uh, that period where the, the actual driver in the driver's seat is the backup system to the, uh, driver assist system or the actual autonomous driving system at that point so th that that period like so th at the end of the day what what should be clear out of it is that you should always pay attention <laughs> that's it there's no until tesla can clearly advertise that they have a fully self-driving system which they actually sell so that's what confusing a lot of people since the, it's a package that they actually sell but it's not yet available as soon as you don't uh, advertise that Always pay attention on the road, and you you, you will be safe. Because we've never heard of, of any accident where the autopilot actually like swerve you outside of the way. We heard the things like ping ponging and coming close to the line, and people just really, but never something like really as severe as what we were seeing in that accident. Which, if the autopilot was the cause of it, it would have to have like there was a, a good like maybe four or five feet between that barrier and the and um, the actual lane. So the autopilot would have to swerve off that lane. I, I I saw some people speculating that <clears throat> it actually thought it was in a lane, like the the uh, the shoulder um, seemed like a lane because there's like a white line on two sides. So it, I think maybe the guy was like he flipped his turn signal. I mean I'm totally speculating. I have no yeah. idea. Yeah, that's but another like, thing. But you would have to have initiated another lane change. Right, the driver so maybe, has to initiate. It's maybe he a initiated a change and it put him into the shoulder lane, which was where he, you know, met his uh, demise. But like, we have no idea. Like, it could be anything. Yeah, and that's the problem because it was such a serious, significant wreck. Um, Tesla doesn't. I don't. I don't know if they're going to be able to re recover any of the logs though. Yeah. Well, the, 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 there was a module that was recovered after the the crash. But I, I'm not sure if it's one that has the uh, autopilot uh, logs in them. We'll, ha we'll have to see. Uh, if if Tesla doesn't require uh, recover them right away, I don't I don't think there's a, a lot of chances for them to re ever recover them. But we'll see. Anyway, that was one of the bad news that it Tesla. Did, well, the crash was last week or the week before that even. Yeah, it was the Friday before that. But uh, this week was the um, uh, the the report that uh, the NTSB was NTSB, talking. Right. Was starting the investigation. Then, at the same time, there was other things that that, that came up. Uh, the Nvidia stuff, like some people linked it to Tesla, which uh, is kind of a stretch in my opinion, but uh, I'm gonna tell you about it anyway. So, Nvidia 
in the verge of the the they have um, like their annual big conference in San, G San Jose when where they unveil all, all their new uh, chips and uh, AI stuff and everything, and on the sideline of that conference, they confirmed that they were suspending their testing on, on their self-driving cars in response to the Uber accident the few weeks back, where uh, the fatal accident with the pedestrian on, in in Arizona. I think we talked about it on the show. I'm not sure if we, if we did. Yeah, yeah, and. Um, so it was in response to that, just because uh, I think Uber has a few chips, NVIDIA chips in, in them, but I'm not even sure it's the one that they, they use for the self-driving program. And uh, so it, it, it seemed more like a PR thing. Like uh, we were, we, we are aware that there's dangers with self-driving cars and we are uh, putting our testing until we, we, we find out what was the actual problem with the, the uh, specific Uber accident. Uh, yeah, okay. and and I think because there's a connection, like you know, the investors don't know all the the, the back end stuff. But I think Nvidia and Tesla, or Nvidia, kind of connected the dots between Tesla and um, the Uber accident. So, yeah, so that, yeah, you're right. So there's there's a link between Nvidia and Uber, which is already vague. The link there. Then there's a clear link between Nvidia and Tesla because of the chips that Tesla use. Uh, the Tesla uses Nvidia chip on the uh, autopilot board. So you're saying that because of those two links, like the right. All together. So investors were like, "Oh man, like you know, Tesla is basically Uber at this point, and they can't make <laughs> autonomous cars." Yeah, and that's clearly not true. But even if it were true, my you know my my kind of worldview on this is Tesla is not an autonomous car company. They're building autonomous cars because that's what everybody's doing. But they're, <clears throat> they're, uh, you know, the, the reason Tesla is Tesla is because they're electric cars, obviously. And they're not just electric cars, but it's the whole electric ecosystem. So even if Teslas didn't have autonomy, and, you know, they don't have autonomy now, but even if they're late on autonomy or they have to use Google for autonomy, they're still making cars that nobody else can make. And they're still have an ecosystem of the solar and the battery and the supercharger network and the the technology, um, you know, their center stack and all these other things. I don't I'm not worried from an investment standpoint. I'm not worried about are they gonna be the first person, the first company to do autonomous. You know, if they're behind Waymo, if they're if they have to use Waymo. If they have to scrap their whole thing and and they just throw Google in there, I don't think that's a big deal for Tesla. I mean, I, you know, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, the Tesla network and stuff that kind of rely on the autonomy. But I think you know Tesla will get there, um, and I'm not too worried about that as as an investment idea. And I, I probably should note uh, we're going to note it on the website. Um, the, the stock went way way down this week. Um, and I don't like to invest in Tesla because of the website, but it seemed too good to be true. Um, two sixty, so I, I got in at uh, I think a little below two sixty. So I'm in Tesla. It'll be noted on the site, and uh, we're going to try not to be Tesla positive for a couple weeks until it gets back up to three hundred. <laughs> yeah, right. But um, I have to disagree a, a little bit on, on that uh, because. I think the autopilot program is very central to Tesla's future. I think um, more than uh, than you think, uh, uh, in my opinion. Be but I, I see where you're coming from because there's a there's such a big difference between the autopilot program and, and what Waymo is doing. And we're going to talk about Waymo in a second because they also had a big announcement this week. Uh, uh, so we're going to go on that. But just because we were on uh, Nvidia, uh, I want to mention the. Uh, we had an exclusive, an exclusive first look at the uh, Tesla um, Autopilot 2.5 uh, onboard computer. So that was the first time that we got access to that. And um, you, you can look on, on the site in the, uh, the description below. We have a link to the first image of that custom-made uh, computer for the Autopilot 2.5. So we know that Tesla first introduced Autopilot 2.0 in uh, October 2016. That was supposed to be the computer that enables fully self-driving capacity. But at the time, Tesla also said that they might need to upgrade the computer at some point, which they 
uh, said they would offer f uh, for free a retrofit to, to the owners. And the first update that we saw of that was in uh, August 2017, the Autopilot 2.5, which uh, brought a new uh, computer inside all the uh, Model S and X. And uh, Model 3, actually, so it was a very similar board as a Model 3. And now on the side, I have a Christmas board, or a bo uh, the boards of each of those. So the 2.5 bo uh, board inside the Model S and X and the 2.5 board inside the Model 3. And uh, uh, the, the main uh, difference is, uh, as we already reported, was a second or a redundant uh, NVIDIA GPU on the board. So more computer power uh, and also like a, a safety net or a redundant uh, safety net for the... Um, uh, for the computer inside the autopilot program also you see all the connections for uh, for for all the different sensors uh you did, that's where there's a difference between the model s and x board and the model 3 uh, for example the selfie camera uh well, well that's that's all, all tesla calls it the selfie camera that's not that's not my my words so the the onboard uh, driver facing camera just under the uh, um the mirror that's on it but other than that is very similar board and the bigger difference is with the uh, MCU board in the Model 3 that was different in the Model X and X. But uh, that's all was also updated as we reported last week. The all new Model S and X vehicles have a, a new MCU too. But now going back to the um, self-driving news this week, the Waymo, uh, there was a big announcement because Waymo, in partnership with Jaguar, unveiled uh, a new self-driving and all-electric high pace. So it's basically the you say my pace that was unveiled uh, last month, just before the uh, Geneva Auto Show, the production I pace, which is coming out later this year, but with the uh, Waymo self-driving technology. So it's equipped with all the same sensors that we already seen on the Chrysler Pacifica that uh, was the main car that uh, Waymo was using. And now it's on a non-electric high pace instead, which is pretty cool. And it's the same, the same idea behind um, the uh the, what you're already using in crosser pacifica is just that instead of uh so it's, it's powering the ride ailing service that they want to do with autonomous ride ailing service that they want to do but instead instead of getting inside a, a, a van you would get into a, a jaguar i pace which is a more premium vehicle and um so it, a little bit com it's comparable to like ordering a uh, a uber x instead of a uber select for example like you, they're both like the driver you have a driver which is way most technology but you you choose a different car you choose a van instead of a and that's where i was looking in back to the difference between tesla's autopilot uh, effort self-driving effort versus uh, waymo is that waymo is clearly still focused just on offering a ride ailing service tesla is very focused on selling cars that's that's their business. They, they, they sell cars to customer that you own. And if you do that, you just can't have like what, what you see on Waymo, which is the, the big leader sensor on top. Uh, and that looks like um, a big nipple on top of the car. <laughs> and uh, the uh, on the sides too, you have like big extrusion for, for the sensor and everything. It just doesn't look good. It looks it, it looks something that I would Perfect, oh, I'll be perfectly fine spending money to uh, travel from point A to point B, but I wouldn't pay money to own that car, which is what Tesla is going for, I think. Why do you think Waymo uh, chooses electric vehicles rather than just picking, you know, like Apple is using Nexus or uh, Lexus, Lexus, I think? And, uh, you know, yeah, uh, Google Lexus. seems to only go after electric cars, even the well, Chrysler Pacifica. Uh, is. I think the big difference is that Apple is very much into just testing right now. So uh, what we're doing, what we're seeing with the Pacifica and now with the I-Pace are actual production cars. Like that, that's what they want to, that's what's going to give you a, the, the service. Like Waymo is talking about launching the ride ending service commercially, publicly, or open to the public by the end year. of the year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on, on, on the, that's another thing that's different with between the uh, autopilot program and Waymo. Um, is that it's uh, it's a geo uh, geo fenced. It's they, they can only open it in a, a specific area that they already have mapped and they have a lot of data on, and, and so they're geo fencing the, uh, the service in a specific area. We, we so the difference between that and autopilot is autopilot. They, they are aiming really with a AI focused system that can just handle anything that you throw at it. Uh, Which is so weird because Google's a very AI driven company. 
yeah, they're AI driven company, but uh, they 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 are big on simulation uh, for their program. I'm big on simulation. Well, Tesla also has a, an autopilot simulation engine that's apparently like a video game. But um, in in the case of Waymo, they're really focused on, on geofencing. So that service is going to launch in Phoenix, and they're going to have those production cars. And I think they're just aware of the of, of the, that the future is electric, and they want their production car to already be electric. And of course, the, the Pacifica made a lot of sense because you, you, you want you if you're doing like a, a, a ride-link service that um, yeah you, you want to pack as many people in the car as possible to get even more efficiency out of because if you go electric and if you go self-driving, you just decrease the cost per mile significantly. Then the the only other thing that you can do at that point is just add more people inside that car, and a van is perfect for that. But uh, I think they want to go with more premium service too, because at first it's going to be more expensive. I think. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Seth, as a, as a, like we said, he's in he's in Florida right now. He's not at his house, and uh, there's a, there's a, a dog in the house. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to continue talking about the Waymo situation, which is that the, those cars are really the production vehicle that we're going to see um, being launched later this year. So that i that you see, they're going to have inside the fleet in Phoenix, and you're going to be able to take a, an app with the, the Waymo name on it and order the car to come pick you up just like a Uber. But there's not going to be anyone in the driver's seat, which, which is which is the idea behind Waymo. Uh, and it, eventually, they want to grow. We we're just talking about the high pace here, not even the Pacifica, which also have thousands of orders right now just for Waymo. Uh, they were talking about twenty thousand units, which was actually surprising. I don't know about you, said, but because uh, the I pace, I don't, I don't think we were expecting big volume for the I pace, regardless yeah, of self driving. That's like what five years worth of cars. Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably uh, at least uh, a year. It, it, it's it's probably a year full. So they were talking twenty thousand over a few years. So it, it might be as much like as twenty percent of their capacity over. Over the next five years or something like that, like in four years or something like that. Yeah, and like that's a huge win for Jaguar because they're basically mm -hmm. they're like subsidizing their first, you know, run of cars, which is. And, and you know what? Uh, what Waymo did for sure, they they, they had to, they had to have tried a bunch of different cars and decided to go with the high pace. But like, so they could have done that partnership with Tesla maybe or something. Like, uh, but what I think made the difference is probably. Tesla doesn't really need the orders, like for at least from all S and X, like 20,000 20, orders. It's, it doesn't make a big, a, that's big a difference for them. And uh, and on Waymo side, it's a competitive. Uh, like Jaguar didn't have a big self-driving program. Uh, right, and with, Jag Jaguar actually needs Waymo. <laughs> like they yeah. probably use their their maps. So Tesla oh. uh, probably wasn't as open as Jaguar for a partnership like that. Uh, I mean, I guess that's why F FCA also has the Chrysler Pacifica is there. Same same reason. Yeah. Well, FCA is never really technology forward anyway. Like, no. You know, no. <laughs> they're always late to the game. But uh, like people in the comments are asking you to, sh to show the dog. Like <laughs> you don't want it to start barking again. <laughs> yeah, I shot him. The dog's the dog's gone. No worries. <laughs> Um, yeah, but uh, moving on to uh, uh, well, if we can come back to the the, the Tesla stock, so uh, the, was yeah, the, the other thing that affected. So we, we think that actually Waymo actually had an impact too on on the stock this week because that was a, a big news that uh, Waymo is still looking forward to launching their um, uh, their service this year, and now there's a big partnership with Jaguar I Pace, which is seen as a competitor to the Model X, even though uh, as we previously reported, it's more. It's more closer to the model Y, which is coming uh, next year probably, but um, that had just a broader impact maybe on the Tesla network, which should be a comp specifically the competitor to, to Waymo. Um, though we haven't heard much about Tesla network for a while now, since it's very reliant on Tesla's ability to deliver a self-driving system, and uh, it hasn't happened yet. The last thing that had an impact on the stock was this the prospect of uh, Tesla eating Model 3 production, which is, of course, uh, the thing that has the most effect on uh, on Tesla stock. And uh, I ended up uh, on the Cheddar. <laughs> Cheddar, how do you say it? Cheddar. Cheddar. Cheddar, Cheddar this because it was like the uh, the new young and hip uh, CNBC competitor uh, to, to talk about um, 
Tesla stock and the uh, the impact on the multiple production. Because a bunch of people, when when the stock started dropping on Monday and Tuesday, uh, started calling, of course, the end of Tesla. Tesla's going bankrupt and and everything. So they invited me on the show to uh, to give like sort of a counter argument to it. Because uh, the Tesla is not going bankrupt, <laughs> people. Uh, the uh, the other bonds downgraded though, and uh, their bonds are just are, are not very attractive right now, uh, which is not the first time that happened anyway. But um, what I think is, if Tesla doesn't end up hitting the uh, multi production target this quarter, which I think is likely. Uh, well, that's not even even the point, actually, because I think even if they miss it by a few hundred units per week, so if, if they reach, let's say, 2,000 units per week, I, th I think that's going to be good, too. The, the, the point that is, that's going to be difficult is if they end up pushing the 5,000 units a week, which is, um, I think, the point that they need to hit to have a positive gross margin on the car. And if they hit a positive gross margin on the car, then uh, the need for new capital to be invested in is not is not as big of an issue. But if the bonds are, are are not um are not really attractive right now and they don't hit the production target, then uh the pretty much the only solution for more capital injection is gonna be uh going to the market for um with some uh, some dilution for the shareholders. Which is bad for the shareholders, of course, but uh where I, I try to have a counter agreement against all the people crying that Tesla is going bankrupt is the fact that uh has Elon Musk ever had any problem raising capital in the last decade or so? Like ever since 2008, 2009, with, with, with the, the issue with uh, the whole market and everything. Since then, Elon Musk has never had any problem raising capital. And even though the uh, global economy now is heading toward maybe a, a, a little recession, uh, it's not a, as dire as it was in 2008, not in close. Uh, I think Elon Musk is going to have no problem. And he's in a much better position to be able to raise capital just from a credibility standpoint, even though, of course, Elon Musk always hit, doesn't hit its targets and everything in terms of uh, timelines, but he's still incredibly credible uh, when it comes to a handful of uh, Wall Street people that have a shit ton of money. <laughs> yeah, and so additionally, um, problems with Model 3, <clears throat> demand is not a problem. Like, that would be a problem. Like, the demand for the mm -hmm. Chevy Bolt, for instance, you know, it's good. It's not great. If you want to buy a Model 3 right now, you'd be lucky to get one by 2020. Like, and that's, you know, that's partially due to the slow ramp up, but it's also due to the 400,000 people still want a Model 3. Closer Tesla to 500,000 at this point. What's that? Closer to 500,000 at this point. Yeah, 500,000. So Tesla does not have a demand problem, which, like, frankly, that's, like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of companies have that problem. So all they have to do, and I say this like somebody who has no idea how hard this is, is ramp up to 5,000 where they supposedly break even and then beyond. And it's, it's just interesting to me that like the world's going to end if they don't hit, you know, 2,500 uh, this, this quarter and 5,000 next quarter. Like theoretically, if they hit two thousand and they get to four thousand next quarter and six thousand the quarter after that, I mean, like, it, it, is Tesla going to be over at that point? No. And no. are people yeah. not going to want their cars anymore? No. Like, it's the just only, not that big of a deal. The only yeah, it's not that big of a deal. The only thing is that if they don't hit it, if if they end up pushing, if they don't hit it like this month, it's not it's not that big an issue. Um, the the other thing that we're going to report about is the uh, Bloomberg uh, email leak for for the the production capacity that said that last week they were at 200, uh, 200 a day and they were pushing for 300 a day by the end of the, of the month so they had like just over a week to get from 200 to, to 300 which sounds very difficult but the the way that they were for a minute is that it can be done if they just push for it. So right, so that would be fourteen hundred a week to twenty one hundred a week. Yeah, so uh, just over two thousand, which wouldn't be that bad, but it would be a miss. But like I said, the the, the most important target is the five thousand a week because that's the uh, gross margin, po the positive gross margin break even point. Now, if they they end up pushing that goal, uh, it, 
a, a capital raise is probably going to be needed. That that that's the only thing. So of course that's bad for the shareholder because it's dilution. But just how big of a capital raise is going to be? And that that's the point that I made on, in the uh, Shadar interview um, on Wednesday. Historically, if you look at how Tesla ends up raising capital, they are not big on going to market with just the idea of we screwed up. We know we need more money to accomplish our current goals. They don't do that. Like that's not Elon Musk's way to, to 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 go to market. They go to market with we have this cool new thing that we need to pay for in order to bring to market. And by the way, we're gonna use some of that capital to just uh, our general operation with our current vehicle programs, like the Model Three that we're trying to get to uh, to as many hand, uh, into uh, as many co customers' hands as possible. So. I wouldn't be surprised that if Tesla goes to market in the next, I don't know, three to six months, it's going to be on the back of another announcement. That announcement, in my opinion, should be the Model Y, which is a hard sell to, to, to bring to people with an announcement if the Model 3 is not going well in terms of production. But if they can really sell the like the 2000 to 300, the, the, let's say that, let's say the eight between 2,000 and 3,000 3, 3, units per week by that time, then it's starting to look good. Like two, over 2,000 units is more than the Model S and Model X combined. So it's starting to be some significant volume there. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that's an impossible scenario here. Yeah, I, it, it, oh, all this together, like every single problem that Tesla's having uh, is easily surmountable, um, isn't like, you know, none of this seems like the end of the, the company. And like when you look at the company a month ago or whatever, when it was selling at 350, um, nothing has changed if you look at the company today so significantly that it warrants a drop in price uh, of a hundred hundred dollars. So it's kind of it's kind of one of the it's a head scratcher for me. I, I wonder if uh, this, all the news coming out, all the you know the bad investment analysis and the New York Times article and all this stuff, it, it feels to me like one of those things where, you know, everybody's ganging up on this, uh, you know, this, this news uh, vortex thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really was a, like, it's, it's hard to point exactly what happened because uh, like it, the news just kept piling up all week or at least the press out of the week. And it, uh, it, keep, it kept adding up to, up to yesterday with uh, the recall. So we haven't talked about that yet, but it was the, the recall that happened for the Model S, uh, all Model S pre-April uh, 2016, which uh, has up to 123,000 vehicles. And of course, all of the headlines were, this is biggest recall in history this week, uh, the 100,000 Model S and uh, this look from, uh, recalls all Model S because of a power steering problem. Hey, Fred, your your mic is doing that that scratchy thing again. Maybe oh. check your connections. Oh, okay. Let me see. Yeah, it's it's just weird that they all seem to be coming at once. And you know, the New York Times article today or last night, um, I can't remember the analyst that was like, "There's no way that Tesla can ever, you know, if you run the financials, they'll never recover from this." It's just like it seems very like straightforward and easy, not easy, but like straightforward. How Tesla gets to five thousand and then profitability, and then you know, it's got a lot of a lot of different avenues to success. All right, uh, is it is it okay right now? Yeah, your mic sounds good. Um, we're at a good break, so I can I'll read our uh, sponsor. Uh, wondercapital.com slash electric is where you go to find the best way to invest in solar. Um, the the best, typically the best way to have solar is to put it on your roof, but that doesn't work for everyone for whatever reason. Maybe you got a big tree from your neighbor blocking your roof or whatever. But um, investing in solar, you can, with wonder, um, it's putting solar somewhere else and you're getting the benefits, which are 7.5%, uh, reach up to 7.5% returns. Uh, small and mid-sized businesses need capital and assistance with solar and wonder is supporting them 
and offering great returns for investors and contributing positively to helping the U.S. catch up in the solar fight, solar and fight climate change. Individuals have already financed more than 175 large-scale solar projects. These solar energy projects create enough electricity to power the equivalent of 5,000 homes, which help offset almost 75 million pounds of carbon dioxide emissions each year. In 2017, Wonder financed over 37 megawatts of solar through more than 115 large-scale projects, which in the first year alone will help offset, for example, 36 million pounds of coal burned or 3.7 million gallons of gasoline consumed. For, for greenhouse gas emissions, that amounts to 23.2 million pounds of waste or in the first year alone, 39,000 acres of U.S. forests in one year or 7,100 cars driven. So wonder is great. Here's why. Even if you have solar in your house, like uh, we, I do, you, you've already built out solar and you want to invest more in solar and get a good return, which is seven point, up to 7.5%. Um, wonder allows you to do that. And uh, if you want to try that, uh, wondercapital.com slash electric. Yeah, wonder is great. And uh, you, if you help them, you help us too at the same time, which is uh, which is awesome. And you help yourself if you you can get some decent returns. So, yeah, I mean Everybody the market is a little the market's a little crazy right now. So yeah, it's, it's also a way to get away from uh, from the stock market instead and invest in uh, in something that uh, has generally been just being very consistent in terms of returns, solar energy. And of course, the best way to invest in it is always on your own home. But if you can. Yeah, uh, that that's another solution. And sometimes, like they invest in bigger project too, instead of just a rooftop project. Well, a house rooftop project, uh, commercial solar can be sometimes more profitable and uh, anything like that. So it's really something to look into, uh, especially if you are an an accredited investor. Uh, you you can directly invest. If not, you can put yourself in the waiting list, and the the they're gonna have soon products for uh, people who are not uh, only accredited investor. Coming back at what I was saying about the recall, though, on the model, uh, model S. Mm -hmm. Like I said, so the, the, the headlines were very scary for a lot of people. But at the end of the day, it's a bunch of bolts on the component made by Botch uh, that uh, can have issues. And it's a problem that was known for a while because, uh, it, 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 like I said, it's a, it's a Bosch. Uh, it's a Bosch component that they sell also to other other companies. So it's on other cars. So other cars have the same issues and everything. And uh, so Tesla was just looking into how to best end all uh, changing those parts because they it was really just a problem for people um, in, in colder regions where they can be uh, salts on the roads and they can be more corrosion on those bolts that ends up um, creating that issues. Where the the bolt can fail and that can uh, affect if, that can affect the power steering of your car. So you can easily make it sound scary, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not it's not scary at all. Like worst case scenario, you like if you're on the highway and that fails, like you don't really need that power steering that much anyway. If you're on the highway, if you're going at high speed, so power steering is more an issue. Like if you if you're in a sharp turn and, and things like that, but. Uh, Tesla did the right thing. They're gonna change it, every car on, on it, and so going back as uh, how it affects Tesla on the on the stock market this week, which was what we were speaking uh, talking about, not a big deal because Bosch will end up uh, covering the cost of the bolts, which I don't think is a big deal anyway. But uh, yeah, convenient and, name is the, uh, the the Chevy Bolt. Yeah, yeah. Actually. can have some confusion there. Yeah. But the biggest cost is probably the service cost, but it's uh, less than an hour per car. It adds up because there are 123,000 of them. But uh, Tesla thinks it's going to be material to their, to their cost, which uh, probably have a better idea than we do. Um, moving on, what haven't we talked about yet? uh tesla launch an automotive training program that was cool this week so i had to talk about uh, i had to talk with uh, the um person in charge of that at the first school where tesla launched a program which is a school in uh in north carolina Car north carolina 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 Sh charlotte <laughs> i think uh what, what is it called it's called the uh, central pmo community college in uh, charlotte north carolina uh it's a 12-week program uh, for Tesla to train new technicians, service technicians. Right now, 
Tesla's main source of recruiting for technician has been just from other dealerships and uh, people that were working on on, on cars, uh, mainly cars with internal combustion engines, and um, people also coming out of uh, of training schools, but also with a focus on internal combustion engines. And they had to train those people internally to uh, make them uh, up to date with uh, Tesla's uh, vehicles. So that was uh, a, a big burden on Tesla, having to train all that staff, and they, they were growing so fast in time of service centers. So they, they, it was becoming an issue. So they, they pretty much outsourced and that to community colleges right now. Uh, of course, they, they are very much involved in those programs at those schools too. But um, it's a way to to branch out and have uh, some satellite schools, if you will, uh, train uh, train the new employees specifically for those cars. And uh, coming out of those program, you uh, you, you can uh, Tesla said you can pretty much come out of those program without any debt. So you you, you get paid throughout the program uh, as you learn, and um, you end up if you uh, if you complete the program with all the requirements, uh, which is have to do with attending and uh, your your scores in, in every classes, uh, you end up with a job proposal. Of course, you need to be open to move. Since right now there's only the school in North Carolina and uh, one in uh, near Los Angeles that have the uh, the program, and of course they need people all over the U.S. and uh, North America, but they, they they're gonna help you move, and you get a you're gonna get a job as a technician in the Tesla service center. And yeah, it seems like a pretty good proposition. Yeah, it's a good proposition for for the, the students. Um, it's not, the uh, the requirement on 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 their website. You can go to tesla.com slash career slash start. The program is called Tesla Start, and uh, they have uh, all the the requirement, which is not exactly that difficult. They're talking about a high school diploma and or a GED, uh, some exp a three point five grade point, a valid driver's license too. Uh, yeah, like I said, be able to uh, relocate in terms of uh, physical ability. They do ask for you to be able to lift 50 to 60 pounds, which uh, shouldn't be that big of an issue for most people. And um, if you're all able to do that and you're able to uh, get to the program and uh, maintain 95% uh, attendance, you uh, and, and of course uh, pass all the classes, you can end up being a Tesla technician from those schools. And Tesla yeah. gets a growing a, a new way to recruit uh, technicians. Yeah, and three month program that doesn't seem too crazy, you know, to you know to up and leave and go to North Carolina, uh, you know, for like a year or something that'd be kind of rough. But three months doesn't seem too bad. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty pretty good proposition. I'm moving on. Yeah, we talked uh, a little bit about the Model 3 production, uh, how it's, it's coming. The big thing this week was, uh, of course, Tesla still registered new VINs with, uh, with Natchita this week. A record month for sure. They were close to 10,000 uh, new uh, new Model 3 registered with, uh, with the federal authorities. That doesn't mean that they, they're going to have produced by the end of the month 10,000 units. But the rate per week is close to those 2,000 units. So Tesla could be finishing the month at a production rate very close to 2,000 units. Like we said, uh, Bloomberg reported from uh, uh, internal emails that said they were just over 200 units per week, uh, and they were pushing for 300, uh, 200 per day, and they were pushing for 300 per day by the end of the, of the month. So not email, impossible. That email kind of felt like an email that Tesla wanted to leak. Yeah. Um, Kind of giving people a heads up of what to expect, um, <clears throat> which may sort of have contributed to the uh, stock going down. Although I don't think so. No, no, I think it was the other way around. Yeah, like by the time that the, the email leaked, uh, it, it helped. Right, I, I agree. I think it, the stock had dropped, and that I mean, it, it didn't send it up too much. It, no, but at least it set expectations. I think people had already expected. Tesla to miss twenty five hundred. I think uh, this this email that leaked with quotation marks um, was kind of like this is where we expect to be. You know, we're, we expect to be at twenty one hundred at the end of the month, and uh, you know, that's kind of set, sets the expectations without 
officially revealing any numbers. Yeah. And uh, all those new um, Model 3 VINs that were registered uh, also came at the same time that uh, Tesla sent a huge batch of invitations in Canada. Uh, something that uh, I, I think it had to be the biggest batch yet because uh, not just in Canada, but period, but that particular batch was for Canadians and reservation holders because I got so much tips about people getting their, their VINs. And I, I know that we have a pretty big following in Canada too, so that, that makes sense also. Maybe every single Tesla owner or soon to be Tesla owner in Canada contacted you yeah well even if that's the case it's still like close to 100 uh, <laughs> of people that, that that got the invite but that's impossible of course so i i'm pretty sure it's a it's a lot bigger than that uh, the batch i i mean but um yeah i got a ton of advice so sorry if i didn't respond to every one of them because it, it was just overwhelming and I, I was keep getting emails and emails about it and twitter messages and stuff like that but uh, yeah, a, a ton of people got the invite in Canada. So that's people that um, uh, waited in line or even some people that just ordered on, on, online uh, the same day or the, the, the next day, uh, maybe even the next day. Yeah. But um, so a lot of people told, uh, did the same thing that I did, like, uh, like I got my invite a week ago or waiting for the all wheel drive. Others are waiting also for the standard battery pack. Uh, but uh, a lot of people are ordering too. And of course, it raised a question since it was such a big, uh, quite apparently a big batch. Is Tesla going to focus for a while? Because those cars are not going to be delivered for the next four to eight weeks. Um, maybe in four to eight weeks, Tesla going to start looking to focus more on Canadian deliveries in order to wait for the um, uh, to to not achieve the two hundred thousand delivery threshold for the federal tax credit. See, I, I believe that. I think Tesla's going to game that pretty hard. But if they game that, they, that's mean that they think they're going to hit the, hit the mark in the second quarter and they're going to push it to the third quarter, to the very beginning of the third quarter. So if those deliveries start four to eight weeks from now, so that means that they might be like a whole month of uh, an awkward month of having uh, no delivery or pretty much no delivery in the U.S. Oh, they just slow it down, right? I mean, yeah. pr production doesn't matter because they can, you know, a lot of production can go to Canada. But I guess it's deliveries, right? That the U.S. counts. Yeah, it's deliveries. Yeah. So if they can keep their deliveries under two hundred thousand until what June thirtieth or July first, then they extend their um, seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. At, forward a quarter yeah for the full quarter instead of just having a few weeks i think it's a real possibility uh but we're gonna have a better idea in the next month or two i i think as uh it, it, we, we're gonna see it with the the rate at which um uh, people are receiving order in the u.s versus can versus canada it, it seemed like a bit difference this week alone but like i said it, it doesn't make sense in terms of the timing of the delivery yet so it might be like our first indication of it but it's not a concrete proof yet. Um, but we're going to keep an eye on that because that's an interesting point and some, something that a lot of reservation holders in the U.S. are, are keeping a close eye to because it can make a, can make a, a big difference on their, on their purchase. Um, now we could, we could finish up with uh, SF Mortars maybe. I think that was an interesting news this yeah, week. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. So uh, we've been reporting on SF Mortars for a while now, which is a, a, a new... Uh, division of uh, Socon, which is a Chinese company better known for their commercial vehicle, and they do also some motorcycles and stuff like that. Pretty big company in, in China, but they, uh, they launched a new subsidiary called SF Motors, and it's more of a global company than just a Chinese company alone. It's a Chinese owned, of course, but uh, they, uh, they have a, a big presence in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, uh, also in Michigan. Uh, I think, yeah, they have uh, a few centers in Michigan. And uh, the big news that we were really uh, last year was that they purchased the uh, the former plant the factories that would do that were making the uh, the Hummers and uh, a few other uh, a Mercedes uh, SUV too they were doing in Indiana. So it's a big uh, assembly plant in Indiana. They ended up purchasing that, and just a few months later, they also purchased the electric powertrain startup founded by Martin Heberhard, who was of course best known as the uh, original Tesla co-founder. And uh, an electrical engineer who has been working on and off in the EV space 
uh, since uh, quitting Tesla back in 2009. Well, quitting Tesla, uh, <laughs> more, being, being pushed out of Tesla by uh, Elon Musk and uh, and shareholders. And since then, he, he's been working like with uh, Volkswagen for a while. He ended up at Lucid Motors when he was still known as Ativia. And uh, two years ago, uh, he started Hinvit, which was his home startup, developing new electric powertrains. So we're talking about battery pack and drive units and everything. And they were uh, it was in partnership with uh, an engineer uh, in Germany. So they, they were based in Germany and in the US. And they developed actually a, a full electric powertrain that they were trying to sell to uh, existing automakers uh, trying to go electric. But uh, SF Motors instead snapped them up for a few a few millions, I think, a few tens of millions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they incorporated their technology into the vehicles that they want to to launch. And this week, the uh, the unveiled the, the, the well. They only the first two vehicles, but I think uh, the, the way they, they talked about it, the, there's only one that's meant for production right now. So it's the SF5 and SF7. And uh, unfortunately, the SS7 is the one that looks super cool, but the, it's the NSF, SF5 that is going to production. And apparently, it's going to production as soon as next year. Of course, we heard that from other start electric yep. startup before. Uh, we're looking at you, Faraday Future. We're looking at you, uh, uh, Lucid Motors, which are both yeah. still saying that they're launching cars this year, but uh, we never know. Yeah, and that's what's kind of frustrating is like this fits the the mold of like another like Chinese company building cars in the U.S. and you know. Like, but I, I where good. where they have a big difference, I think, with uh, SF Motors and those two other companies that we just mentioned, is that those two other companies, the first thing they did was marketing and launching their concept cars and pushing the concept cars hard. And uh, look at what we build; it's so cool, it's so powerful, it beats Tesla in every way, and blah 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 blah. Instead, the way we first heard about SF Motors where they, they're referred to bring something to market. So they focused on the manufacturing part. If they, they, they already bought a, a plant, and it's a plant that was, as of quite recently, already producing electric vehicles, uh, not, not electric vehicles, excuse me. Commerce, the yeah, opposite. Commerce. <laughs> they, they, were, they were producing cars. <laughs> While uh, both Lucid and Faraday Future, the first thing that they did, they, they said they were going to build their own uh, factory from the ground up and billion dollar factories each. So. Uh, in that sense, SF Motor is a lot closer to Tesla, which, of course, uh, ended up buying the um, uh, new me plant in Fremont from Toyota. That was a plant that was recently producing vehicles, too. And that was a big advantage for Tesla to bring the Model S to market. So there's some similarities at that. Uh, there's, some, there, there's some links there. But uh, yeah, going back to, to, to those vehicles that, they, that, that they're showing here today, uh, they, talking about the uh, premium vehicles. So they haven't talked about pricing, unfortunately, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, I would be surprised if it's anything below $60,000 or anything like that. I think it's gonna be over $60,000. And uh, so some spec, uh, different motor configuration from uh, two to four motors, uh, up to 1,000 horsepower. Uh, they talked about a range. 1,000 horsepower would be pretty big. Yeah. and uh that was for e uh, for the sf well so, so they were sort of a mid-sized suv uh comp mid-sized suv crossover tough to describe the car you can look at the link every, on the track but um let's say like mid-sized suv it's pretty powerful for sure from uh 1000 uh 100 kilowatts to 400 kilowatts depending on so it's 100 kilowatts per motor basically no, so, so you can have a single motor so if it's a single motor, you can you can probably get uh, a cheaper version of the car. In terms of range, they haven't talked about the battery pack capacity, but they uh, they said that they were aiming for more than 300 miles EPA rated, 500 kilometers, and EDC. They haven't got the memo that the, no one is using any EDC anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they also, so did the focus on the presentation this week was also on their manufacturing capacities. So they, they presenting themselves as sort of a global company. So they have the plant in Indiana, like you said, but they also have another plant in China uh, based at the uh, SoCon uh, 
headquarters. They have like a big SoCon campus. Uh, SoCon just makes a ton of stuff. So they have a lot of uh, resources uh, in, in China. Um, I think they're going to be pretty serious in the space. Good. I, I welcome their, their entry into the electric EV marketplace. I don't think, uh, I don't think Faraday Future or Lucid are, are really helping out at this point. They're kind of being the cylindra of cars. <laughs> that people point to and say, yeah. hey, see, EVs don't work. If his car was already the cylinder of, of EVs, so, so right. now we, so you can see there are the new Fiskars then. Right. Uh, no, we're not being fair. I mean, they're not dead yet. Uh, Fisker did die and now he's reborn. And apparently Fisker is going to, uh, like, not not the karma, but the Fisker, the new Fisker uh, from Henrik Fisker, apparently he's going to have some news this week, uh, next week. I'm going to look into that. But uh, be, uh, 4,000 kilowatt car and it's going to have uh, solid state batteries that'll last a month, you know, a month of driving. Yeah, so, and, and it's going to be out uh, tomorrow. Right. And uh, you're going to have the same technology in your phone the next day and right. uh, all those nice promises that uh, Henry Fiskers like to do. But he does build pretty stunning pretty vehicles. Cars. Yeah. Very pretty cars. So we always like to look at them. I don't know if I would put my money into one of them, but <laughs> we, we're going to hear how he's going to say. But other than that, that's pretty much it for, for this week's episode, guys. So thanks a lot for listening and watching on YouTube and uh, all your podcast app. We want to take some sponsors, as usual, Wonder Capital, uh, sponsoring this week's episode. Thanks a lot. You can always go to wondercapital.com slash electric for uh, checking out their offering in terms of solar investment. Also, a big thanks to our Patreon supporters. Now over uh, close to 230 of you are supporting us on Patreon for the podcast and the website, which is a big, big help. Yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, we're going to see you next week. Seth's going to be back in New York. I'm going to be Montreal as usual. <laughs>